We're speaking with Elliot Abrams, who is now at the Council of Foreign Relations, but was an, an advisor to two American presidents, Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush, uh, on foreign affairs. Uh, human rights, I believe, in the, in the Reagan administration. Human rights and then Latin America. And then Latin America. And then Middle East with uh, George Bush uh, presidency. So obviously a very, a very uh, broad perspective on foreign policy. And you're here at the uh, Israeli Presidential Conference tomorrow, 2012. Uh, let me ask you, and you're actually the first American that I'm interviewing here. Uh, so uh, I'm honored. <laughs> well, I'm honored to uh, be talking with you. Uh, let me ask you, do you think that the American policy, current American policy, towards Israel and the Palestinian uh, conflict, do you think it's been effective? And uh, what are you hearing here at the conference that, uh, about feedback about our policy? Well, I think it's clearly been ineffective. Uh, you can argue whether it, the policy is fundamentally right or wrong. I don't think you can argue much about the ineffectiveness, and that is what uh, Israelis say. I mean. The initial policy, which demanded a 100% um, construction freeze, was actually abandoned by the administration. The Israelis and Palestinians have been negotiating for uh, 30 years, but not for the last two years, not for the last two and a half years of the Obama administration. So that is, in a way, a measure of how ineffective the policy has been. The president is trying very hard to get the negotiation going, and he can't do it. So there you go. It's an ineffective policy. The, uh, and you've written about this, I, uh, you wrote, wrote about it in, uh, in the Washington Post, uh, in a brief uh, piece in the Washington Post last year, about the uh, damage that was done by insisting on a settlement freeze, something that the Palestinians yes. themselves had not insisted on. Right. Um, how about um, President Obama's, I, don't, I hesitate to call it a demand, but framing the, framing the issue in a speech recently about that the, the solution is going to be based on 1967 borders. That obviously did not go over well here. Um, it's not an unusual statement, but it's unusual in the fact that it came from the president. Um, yeah, I, um, you know, the president, um, you can say he's reflecting reality, but what I think he's doing is undermining the Israeli negotiating position. Uh, when they sit down, uh, there has to be some kind of reference point or map on a table, if they ever do sit down, to negotiate. And um, that will be the 49 armistice lines, which the president calls the 67 lines or 67 borders. Um, but what President Bush said was, uh, look, everybody has to understand there will never be a return to the 1949 armistice lines. They're gone. And the two sides just have to negotiate what comes next, what will be the borders of Israel and Palestine. Uh, president Obama, by saying that um, the border will be the 67 line with agreed swaps, undermines the Israeli position by saying, no, we're not starting from zero, and uh, we're not saying we'll never go back to 49. What we're saying is it's 67 plus anything you can get the Palestinians to agree to. And what does that mean? Well, for one thing, think of the western wall of the temple uh, in the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem, which was conquered by Jordan in the 1948 war the Arab effort to prevent the foundation of the State of Israel. And then Jordan kept it from, from 48 to 67. So if you say that it's the 67 line with agreed swaps, that means Israel has to swap its territory to get the western wall of the temple. Now why is that? What gives the Palestinians the right to the temple to say, no, 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 you, you need to give us territory if you expect to keep that? Same thing for the whole Jewish quarter of Jerusalem. So I think in that sense, the president would have been a lot better off, and Israel would have been a lot better off had he just said, guys, you need to negotiate a border. Which was the American, posi the American presidential position through several administrations. If you go back to the 67 war, you begin with President Johnson saying, Israel should not return to the 67 borders, which have produced war after war after war, and are not secure borders, and and Johnson said, I'll never ask him to do it. Reagan said the same thing. Secretary of State Schultz under President Reagan, same thing. So for, for decades, it's been the American view that a return to the 67 borders was, which were never borders, um, was not something we favored or would push Israel to do. And I think if the president had said, <laughs> what President Bush said basically, everybody knows there'll be no return to those lines, now go out and negotiate. That would have been better.
here at the conference, you headed a uh, breakout session um, asking if the love had cooled between Israel and America. Um, I unfortunately only was able to duck into that session very briefly. Uh, what's your view on that? Do you think that, the, that there is a, a cooling of the relationship between Israel and America at, at any level? Uh, no, um, not between Israel and America, and not between the American population and Israel, and I think opinion polls suggest that. There's certainly been a cooling at the presidential level, in my view. That is, I don't think President Obama has the warmth of feeling uh, an emotional understanding of Israel that President Clinton had or that President uh, Bush had. Um, I don't think it's at the popular level in the U.S. Uh, at all. Uh, I just think it's unfortunate that, that the President doesn't share the broader American view. Let's go back a little bit to uh, Gaza. Uh, Ariel Sharon pulled out of Gaza and uh, that was considered uh, at least a, a, a step in, in a direction uh, it's certainly very controversial here, controversial in the United States. Uh, an election followed. Uh, this was during the Bush administration. I think it was while you were still mm -hmm. an advisor yes. to, to President Bush. Uh, Hamas ended up participating in that election and ended up, ended up winning it. Uh, how damaging has that been to, uh, to the concept of, of changing land for peace, for instance, and to getting uh, any kind of negotiations back on track? Uh, quite damaging. Um, I think that um, the first, we made some mistakes in the, in the pullout from Gaza. Uh, Sharon made some mistakes. I don't think the pullout was a mistake, but I think the failure to negotiate security conditions with the Palestinians was a mistake, and the failure to hit hard immediately when the rockets started coming. Uh, in the fall of 2006, within weeks of the Israeli pullout. I think he should have hit him harder, and I think he would have had American, and in those days, even European support for doing that. With respect to the Hamas participation in the election, um, it was very controversial, and what the Palestinians said was, they are the opposition to the Fatah party, and if we don't let them participate, then it's a phony election. It's like a, an election in Syria or Tunisia or someplace like that. Right. Um, and instead of legitimizing the Palestinian government, it will delegitimize it because our opponents won't have been permitted to participate. Where the American government came out was, well, we won't say they have to lay down their arms to participate in the election. We'll say they have to lay down their arms to participate in the government should they happen to win the election. We didn't think they would win the election. But um, this was a mistaken view, I think, in retrospect, we can say that clearly. Uh, first, people accused us of hypocrisy um, because we we said, um, you know, after they, they we said they could participate, but then after we won the election, we said they couldn't join the government. Uh, it was very hard for us to explain the position. Right. But I think uh, the more principled position would have been no, you have to lay down your arms, and it's not just Hamas; uh, it's people in Kosovo. It's people in Sri Lanka. It's anywhere. A, a terrorist group cannot participate in an election until it stops the terrorism and lays down its arms. Say, Lebanon, Hezbollah. So, in retrospect, um, even if we had won the election, uh, it, it was a mistake of principle to allow them to participate. And that's a problem now because Fatah and Hamas have uh, signed a, a partnership agreement, which. Yeah, it kind of goes back and forth a little bit. Nobody's sure how exactly stable that partnership is going to be, but doesn't that complicate the issue of, of getting back to negotiations? Sure. Uh, the Hamas participation has got to make any Israeli wonder, who am I negotiating with, and are they sincere about uh, peace if every other day they're giving a speech about bringing about the destruction of Israel? Uh, even since they've agreed on a unity agreement, the um, uh, Hamas... Prime Minister has said their goal is to put an end to the Zionist adventure in Palestine. In other words, the end of the state of Israel. Right. So that that pretty much makes it. Uh, you hear here at the at the conference, and I try to wrap up on this question here. Repeated calls that we've got to get back to the negotiations. We've got to get back to the negotiations. We can't put preconditions on on negotiating. Um, at this particular conference, that's a very popular position. Uh, can you, can you get back to negotiations when one side is utterly delegitimizing the existence of the state that, that you're in? You can get back to negotiations right now because 
this unity agreement has not taken effect yet, and because the actual negotiations are done by the PLO, not by the Palestinian Authority government. Uh, but uh, you can't get anywhere in the negotiations. So you can start them and get past the September UN problem, and then they'll collapse as they did in September 2010. Elliot Abrams, thank you so much for sitting down with us. It's a pleasure. You're very welcome.